Pseudopod is extruded into this universe from a dimension of purest fear. It's beautiful in its own alien way, but what's to come will unsettle you. Pseudopod, 608, August 17th, 2018. This week's story, A Visit to the Catacombs by Joe Weintraub. everyone. Welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story comes to us from Joe Weintraub. Joe has published fiction, essays, translation, and poetry in all sorts of literary reviews, periodicals, and regional publications throughout the USA. Many of his pieces have been anthologized, and he has received awards for fiction and creative nonfiction from, among others, the Illinois Arts Council, the Barrington Arts Council, and Holy Names University. He's currently a member of the Dramatists Guild, and he has staged readings, radio dramas, and one-act plays produced throughout the USA and Australia. As a translator, he has introduced the Italian horror writer Nicola Lombardi to the English-speaking public. You can find out more about all of this at his website. The story was originally published in Karamu, Volume 20, Number 2, in Spring 2007, a literary review out of Eastern Illinois University. In addition, a shortened version has been used by Joe in readings around the Chicago area, including at the Twilight Tales reading series at the Red Lion Pub, then the only haunted bar in the Chicago metropolitan area. Your reader for this story is Halloween Bloodfrost. Because representation and acknowledgement is important, Halloween identifies as a female, with the understanding that transitioning is not a requirement to acceptance. The guilt that arises from not living up to another's expectation is simply a passage to maturity and self-acceptance once it's let go of. Je or je pronouns reflect that understanding. Thank you for yours. So, get ready, because we have a story for you. We promise you, it's true. A Visit to the Catacombs by J. Wauntraub Narrated for you by Halloween Bloodfrost Buongiorno Welcome to the Catacombs of Via Alta Monteveque The grandest and one of the most ancient in the world I will be your guide for this special Pilgrim's tour in the English language. If you have a book in advance, you will find a number 34 stamped on your ticket. If you have not booked in advance, you have no business being here. <laughs> Please, return tomorrow in the morning when there will be more tours for you in several languages. Uh, For those of you who have a book in advance, please, step inside. Again, welcome to our tour. I trust you have all assigned the waiver, and have also had the opportunity to visit the facilities as instructed. Good. Uh, The visit will be of a long duration, and there will be no opportunities once we are inside. Now... Please, hand over your tickets. Twelve places only. Thank you. Thank you, grazie. Thank you. Thank you, please. Step inside. Thank you. Before we proceed further, several consonants need to be spoken. Please, stick close to me together, so you will hear all of my instructions and absorb all the history and the other observations without the need for repetitions. But, more important, you must not stray from the group. This is absolute. The galleries of the Altamore Vecchi are quite uh, 
intricate and are estimated to extend over 15 kilometers, longer than even the great complex of Domitila outside the walls of Rome. Galleries lead into galleries in a most confusing manner, intersect with upper and lower levels, and at its outermost extremities to the east and to the south, Merge with own safe pagan Columbria linked to the worship of Mitra and Sabusa. If you become lost in these extremities, there is no assurance you will find your way out or be found. In the past century, in fact, an entire class, 16 students and their professor, disappeared without a trace. Of course, uh, you might be saying to yourself, all I need to do is follow my way back towards the light. But that is not uh, such an easy thing as uh, you might think. Uh, I myself uh, once thought in a similar manner, but I mistakenly took a passage that led me in the opposite direction. And when I tried to retrace my steps, I could only see an occasional flickering, like um, fireflies on a moonless night. Fortunately, I had not penetrated far, but there are sectors where huge crevasses have opened quite deep enough to swallow anyone but straight from the guided tour and then gone from there into eternity. Even in ancient days when the galleries were new and expanding, guides like me were hired and the passages were obstructed to prevent visitors and relatives from losing their way and eventually polluting these holy places with their unsanctified corpses. So, please, stay with the group and avoid curious wanderings. We want you to enjoy your visit. Also, please, avoid touching the walls and the masonry. The galleries we will be visiting are quite safe, but catacombs require a soft, penetrable rock, like this tufa. Slabs can be easily dislodged, and there are pockets just beneath the surface where the rock becomes loose and granular, almost uh, like liquid. Uh, also, the ancients strengthened many of the vaults and stress points with brick, mortar, and plaster, all subject to erosion. You do not want to risk bringing down several tons of volcanic rock upon our heads uh, uh, for a souvenir. <laughs> no. Um, and, and, and yes, uh, to remove anything from the premises, from the smallest stone to an undiscovered fragment of a relic, is a criminal offense. The Altamoreveke catacombs are a national treasure. So, we are understood... Are the questions? Very good. Uh, we can begin our tour. Please hold on to the railing and proceed carefully. The descent is a steep, and the steps are as old as the catacombs themselves, carved directly from the rock and rubbed smooth by the footsteps of numberless pilgrims, just like yourself. Not the small square apertures cut into the walls where oil lamps were placed to light the way for many centuries, depositing an impressive residue of soot and grime along the passageway. Another reason to avoid contact with the walls and to thank Providence for the miracle of electricity. We arrive now at the most recent construction, an extensive marble altar erected shortly after the rediscovery of the catacombs during the so-called 
bloody schism. Here it is said that many sacraments were performed in private until the authorities of the Counter-Reformation put a stop to it. Note the fine decorative ornament on the altar stone with the garlands and cornucopia almost pagan in their exuberance. Now, as we turn down this path and then into this one, uh, you will note that all natural light has vanished behind us without the electrical lights on the walls and the torch in my hand we would be in a total darkness here along both walls in the displays behind the glass are the artifacts that have been found in the tombs and their surrounding spaces note the iron the bronze and the ceramic lamps that i mentioned earlier also, we have the digging tools, a matox, and a pig left by the fossares, numerous offerings, coins, glass, vials, earthenware vessels, and mementos of the dead, rings, bracelets, and brooches, and even this toy doll carved from ivory, found embedded in the stucco sealing the grave of the eight-year-old Arulia I sent. In the far corner, you see pottery shards, cooking pots, stone fetishes, and iron utensils of great antiquity. These were found at the end of the last century, with the collapse of a wall during excavation that revealed behind it a cavern hidden since Neolithic times. Among the shards and cookware were fragments of human bones also scorched like the pottery it is unknown whether this was the result of a primitive funerary practices or as one radical archaeologist suggests signs of ritual cannibalism among our native ancestors in either case it speaks of the long habitation of the site and its ancient ceremonial significance. Now, as we turn into the central gallery, look up to the roof of the vault. Near was once a skylight, you see the great image of the Majestas Domini, thought to have been painted in the late third century. The scholars tell us that since this is the first known portrayal of Christ in throne surrounded by a nimbus, a device typical of pagan iconography, the painting is likely to have been superimposed upon an earlier fresco of Helios, god of the sun. It is also exactly here at this spot just where that young lady is standing. No, 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 miss, you, you don't need to move. No, no. <laughs> um, where Thomas, the shepherd, fell through that very skylight above us to his death. The opening had been sealed long before to prevent such an unfortunate incident, but perhaps uh, several months uh, of floods and the seepage led to its collapse. We can only hope that enough natural light followed him from his fall to illuminate the magnificent image above him as Thomas lay there on his broken back, dying. Uh, Thomas uh, was given credit for the rediscovery of the Arthur Monteveque catacombs, but in the truth, it was his herd of abandoned sheep and he's a barking dog that brought the villagers to the site. And if it had not been for the intercession of Father Adrian, now beatified by the Holy See, uh, the opening may have been quickly resealed by the superstitious peasants and the catacombs again forgotten. A simple parish priest, Father Adrian, 
was also a learned man and deeply committed to the defense of the church against a violent iconoclasm then wreaking havoc and bloodshed across the countryside. What a superb witness then is this striking of vision above us to the importance and the power of the image for the first believers, the founders of the true church. As we descend deeper into the earliest parts of the complex and turn here, we arrive at the corridor of the martyrs, the most important of our pilgrim sites. Yes, it is quite impressive, isn't it? Row upon row, tier upon tier of burial slots, graves like a shelves or uh, birds uh, on a ship carved into the rock. They are called luculi, and they extend seemingly endlessly into the darkness, ample evidence of the ferocity of the third and fourth century persecutions, particularly during the reigns of Valerian and Diocletian. No, all of the luculi here were emptied of their remains Long ago, some of the victims of barbarian plunderings, others uh, translocated to the surface where they could be venerated more publicly, and still others transported far beyond our borders during the 8th and the 9th centuries when the market for relics was especially active and profitable. And, uh, of course, not all of these are the graves of the martyrs or saints. Most of the epitaphs and graffiti were inscribed years before the burials and entire communities wished to be entombed near those who could intercede in their behalf in the world to come. But note the simplicity and the starkness of the arrangement and the lack of ornament or display, testimony to the modest circumstances of the original believers, but also the willingness of those in higher stations to humble themselves as part of a congregation before God. But still, martyrs and saints were laid to rest here, and we know for a fact that in this tiny niche the holy Paladin once reposed, and in these six graves, one atop the other, lay the six coronati, Praetorian guards converted, brutally tortured, and thereafter crowned with the gift of martyrdom. Here, at my eye level, once was the saintly Petrus, and in this narrow slot just below, lay his skin, now venerated in Budapest. In here the holy Valeria was interred, although her head was claimed for Via Alta Marina. Here the Palomon the Elder and by his side Palomon the Younger, or at least those parts that could be retrieved from the horses. Poseidus, Pontus Lea, Aprius, said to be a follower of the anti-pope Novation, Dalmatius, Oneger, Vitalia, Rubilia, Victor, and one, two, three, four, five sons of Renata, and above the blessed Renata herself. Beneath this cavity, you can still see engraved the single word Stercorius, or Abandoned in Garbage. Although whether this is the name of the matter, or simply where his remains were first deposited, is unknown. These two cavities, when opened, first seemed empty, both the inscriptions and the traces of paint 
seemingly depicting flames on the arcosolium of this one, convinced the ecclesiastical authorities that the heavy residue of ash found inside was none other than Saint Avengers. In the other one, in there, nothing more than two pairs of pincers were found, but it was believed that the shreds of flesh soldered into the grooves of the prongs once belonged to Saint Marcella. Further on down the loculi become more sparse, but the graves increase again in number as we move into the latter half of the 4th century with its multitude of Herodoxies, and then, at the end of the passageway beyond the grating, the surprising ornate ossuarium of the Heresiarch Ostia, who was interred here with the bones of two hundred of his slaughtered followers. If you visit this smaller complex at Via Arta Marina, you will see the crypticum of the Archbishop Fabian who has been credited with the extermination of the cult. Now, allow me to turn on the interior light and as you pass the grating, look toward the lunette of the arcosolium just above the altar and you will see a series of remarkably realistic, chthonic and zoomorphic representations painted by an anomalous Thracian artist who if the inscription is to be believed or sympathetic to the sect and eventually join them. Oh, my, oh no, don't be frightened, please, madam. This, this happens on occasion. Our failures like these are common in the late summer. Or perhaps there has been a short circuit. This is severe humility. Here, let me try something. The switch just over here. Uh, sometimes after an overlord can simply kick it off. There. And then I'll wait a moment before I click it back on. There. No, that's not it. I suppose it is a power failure. We have had a very oppressive summer, and I'm sure the lights, air conditioners, refrigerators, and such above ground are all in the black too, just like we are here below. But still, we must proceed, and thankfully, I have the light of my torch to guide us. The batteries were replaced several weeks ago, so we should be fine. Uh, but please, stay close to me as uh, we move on. Uh, these stairs will lead us to the next level below and into the 5th century. I will shine a light on the steps, but be sure to take hold of the railing as you descend. Yes, I know it is a bit austerity from the porous nature of the rock here, but it will be perfectly safe if you proceed carefully. Here, I have reached bottom, and if you will first gather around me, we will continue into the gallery. On this level, we witnessed the enormous growth of what was once a tiny congregation of true believers now spread across the land, despite the state's attempts to eradicate them. Again, row upon row, tier upon tier of graves, excavated at considerable cost, yet worth the expense to those who wish to be interred nearby the saints and martyrs of previous generations. Uh, here, much of the original plaster and terracotta tiles are still in place, along with the remains interred inside. Uh, apparently, this level was unknown to the barbarians and others who vandalized the tombs, but they would not have found much value had they in fact penetrated this far. These were ordinary folk, their bones not worthy of public veneration. The mementos interred with them copper jewelry, vials of ungrant small coins, and toys for the children, all of little artistic or monetary worth. But still a unique sight, since many 
of the epithets here are uh, visible as when they were inscribed into the plaster. See, he requisit here, and here he requisit, and here he requisit, and up and down the gallery, he requisit, he requisit, he requisit. Not uh, very creative, this ordinary folk, but an impressive display, uh, nevertheless. Uh, as we turn towards the chamber reserved for your group, uh, the corridor becomes uh, very narrow. Please, single file here, and you might want to place your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you until we reach the great cryptocoporticus of the Nilo at the Spelunca Magna. Now, attention please, as we turn here, the rubble you see on the right spilling into your path sees a traverse gallery that once led to the famous Cabela of the Good Shepherd all destroyed when the passage and several others collapsed five years ago last month during the previous eruption of Alta Moradeque and the ensuing earthquake. An unredeemable loss. Uh, by the by, I hope you had the opportunity to visit our Alta Moradeque volcano during the evening time. A spectacular display particularly around the crater where the lava flow is in especially impressive. Here you see the plaque recently dedicated to the Dacian pilgrims who were awaiting the return of their guide when the first tremor struck. Unfortunately, my good friend Nicolo, who is still on the surface, was killed instantly in the collapse of the basilica and with so much chaos and devastation above, little thought was given to those awaiting the colo here below. Of course, it probably was no matter, since the galleries and cubiculi hereabouts seemed to have disappeared completely. At least, when the shafts were sunk from above, they struck nothing but rock and excavations here were abandoned in face of the tons of solid granite that had tumbled into the passageway. It was no accident, some superstitious people say, that the incident occurred in the vicinity of the cubiculum of Danilo. And here we are. Note the brick masonry of the vault required to support the tufa in this sector, and the plaster surfaces were fragments of color from the frescoes that once appeared here can still be seen. Over there, behind the grating, is the throne of Danilo, carved from solid rock, and where beads of gold leaf still sparkle in the light of my torch. On either side of the seat occupied by the catechist and the presiding deacon and the low stone benches uh, were probably set aside for the instructions of the catechumens. No one knows what rites were performed here, although there are suggestions of a corrupt Eucharist liturgy. The paintings were largely destroyed before the purifications of the late 5th century, but note the remnants of La banquette scene on the vault, either a celestial room or uh, diabolical convivium. And over there is what might be the earliest representations of the devil. You can barely see the gaping mouth of the demon amidst the roaring flames of hell. Although some scholars say it is rather the mole of the Leviathan about to swallow Jonas and the flames are merely waves. Uh, behind the throne is the crypt where the sarcophagus of Danilo was dressed. The walls here too were once covered with frescoes and grotesque wares, but in this instance even the plaster was scraped from the masonry and nothing remains. 
Of course, the great apostate was never interred here, but his ashes scattered to the four winds. It is said by the superstitious people that his spirit animates these corridors when the sun disappears in the waste. Now, we descend in this direction and please form again into a very narrow single line. Careful, the ground is uneven and you will notice a trembling at your feet as we cross over a very swift subterranean river. The current is especially strong this year because of the heavy summer rains, and this explains the thick moisture on the walls and the chill in the air. No, no matter. That was only a quarter draft. I'm sure that passed over your feet. From the river, probably. There are no vermin down here. And we arrive at our terminus. This uh, chamber is called the Cabela of Peace, from uh, the inscription in Perche in Terranum, engraved over the portal. All of you, come inside. You must now remove the robes from your packs and uh, put them on. There are uh, additional robes on the shelf there if you neglected to bring one. Place your packs, your guidebooks, and your other belongings in the corner here. They will be safe. Be sure all of your garments are well covered. The locula here are clean. All remains and offerings, of course, have been removed, but dust and dirt continue to erode from the walls. Use the hoods to protect your heads, but careful. Not to wrap it around your nose or mouth. It will be close enough for you inside as is. All the loculi here are about the same size, but the elderly among you may want to choose the ones closest to the ground. There are step ladders about for those of you who can climb to a higher tier and are not uncomfortable with the sensation of a height. Uh, no, I'm sorry. You must all find a place for yourself. Yes, I know. People do change their minds, but there is nothing I can do about it now. You have come this far, and you must carry on to the end. No, I cannot take anyone back under any circumstances. You must find your place here. There are no benches or uh, resting spots nearby. And besides, you must not leave the chamber in my absence. Especially now that you are suffering through a power failure. I assure you, this is an experience that will change you forever. To meditate among our ancient martyrs and saints in this famed locus sanctus to join spiritually a community of primitive believers and the pilgrims and the people of God who followed in their path and acted as you are about to act. This is a privilege permitted only to a few and many have waited in vain for years to participate. As the graffito over there reminds us, intra lemina sanctorum Quod multia cupiunt et rari exerciante. So, take my hand, and you can slide in right here. That's right, on your back with your arms crossed over your chest. A nice fit, yes. I know it feels tight. It often feels tight. Our Ancestors were smaller than we are, and they usually arrived here in a state of considerable desiccation. But this will help you to remain still. You must not move or shift your position. You certainly do not want to wedge yourself inside by trying, say, to uh, turn on your stomach. And be sure, all of you, to avoid sudden movements. Tufa is a soft rock 
but it is rock nevertheless, and the mantocks have left sharp ridges. Uh, those tremors, I am sure they know more than the vibrations from the river running beneath us nearby. Uh, now, all of you, now that you have found your places and are comfortable, breathe slowly and quietly. If you become anxious, concentrate on breathing more slowly, regularly, silently, otherwise you will feel as if you are suffocating, which only contributes to your anxiety. Respect the meditations of those around you and the sanctity of the place. Yes, I know, I have participated in this very chamber twice myself. I know how tight it can feel, and I too have tasted in my mouth the dirt and the greed of the place. But that is all a part of the experience we promised you, as is this. There, I have extinguished my torch, and you find yourself within a darkness so profound it is palpable. Do not be afraid. Study the darkness. Look into the darkness until it becomes one with you, and you are one with it. Separate from every living thing in the world above. I can find my way out in the darkness. Ignore the quiet breath of your neighbors and allow the silence to envelop you as I leave. I should be back before very long. All stories are based not just on trust, but on the subversion of trust, voluntary or otherwise. The magician that stands front and centre is going to lie to you. You know this. They know this. The willful suspension of disbelief creates a situation wherein you are, in essence, carrying out a heist on your own subconscious. We hear a band, and yet there is no band. We see the rabbit hidden in the table, but still applaud when it's pulled out of the hat. That power... That ability to fool ourselves is the most extraordinary evolutionary defense mechanism. A friend used to refer to it as his shield of banal optimism. If he didn't know something was terrible, then he could endure it, because that was just how things were. We, as a species, are very good at not looking horror in the eye. We are, better still, at enduring. There have been several points in my life where I have felt, as an individual, entirely too good at enduring. 
because that defense mechanism, that ability to survive in gradually boiling water, is also one of our biggest weaknesses. We survive, we don't live. We endure, we don't progress. We accept gradually escalating problems and restrictions because it's not that bad, which is human for it's not happening to me yet. Worse still is the fundamental need we all have to believe in and trust authority figures. Of course a tour guide won't steer you wrong. Their oath of protection to you is in the job title. Of course they've done this before. Of course they'll be back. We'll be there just a little while. Just a little while longer. What haunts me here is not the smartly realized central idea, but the image I cannot shake of the guide safe and secure at home, in the dark, a foot away, listening to their clients scream and panic and doing nothing. And further to that, the lack of context that that void, that black space demands that we try to fill. The narrative dark the story exists in, do these people deserve it? How many have gone before? How many have come back? There are incredible stories out beyond the campfire, and this is one of them. Thanks to both. Expertly done. We rely on you to pay our authors and cover our server costs, and there are a couple of different ways you can do that. Um, you can go to Patreon and donate for a whole variety of amounts per month. The one you probably want to take a look at is five bucks a month, if you can manage it, because that gives you access to our constantly updating premium content folder, and there's a bunch of stuff that goes in there. I think there's a couple of files added every month, in fact. Alternatively, you could go to pseudopod.org, click on Feed the Pod, and let's choose between donate or subscribe. Donations are the amount you want them to be. Subscriptions, again, start from around five bucks, and again, give you access to the premium content folder. Alternatively still, if financially you can't support us but you still want to help out, you could signal boost. If you have a blog or a podcast and you could use a guest or an interviewee, get in touch. We love doing that stuff. Alternatively, if there's an episode you've really liked, tweet about it. Or mention it on Facebook. Or leave a review on iTunes and Google. Or ask Spotify why they haven't got any of our shows besides Escape Pod yet. Or if you're feeling incredibly efficient, do all of them. There are lots of ways that you can help, and not all of them involve money, but we do need all of them, so if you can help out, please do, and know that you have all our gratitude when you do. Pseudopod will return next week with A Little Delta of Filth by John Paget and read by Dagny Paul. Then, as now, it will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. And we leave you with this quote from The Enigma of Amagara Fault by all-time horror great Junji Ito. This is my tunnel. They dug it for me. Have fun, folks. We'll see you next week. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.